Father, it will be my voice that's heard, but we pray that yours will be heard also in our hearts. We pray that your spirit will talk to us and will guide us in our thinking. In Jesus' name. Amen. It's really lovely for me to have the opportunity to come and speak here. I've been in the congregation on many a time, but I've never stood in front, so it's a new experience for me. As I sat in a headmaster's study one day, he spoke these words to me. Why on earth did you ever become a teacher if you hated your school life so much? Well, the answer seemed abundantly obvious to me, that I hated my school experience and I wanted to give the kids that I spoke to and dealt with a better experience than I had had. I pointed that out to him, but it didn't really seem to make a deal of difference. But I did have an interesting background in school life. I was very happy at junior school and I hated every moment of grammar school. I couldn't wait to leave. I was fed up to the back teeth with it. And it wasn't until I found myself in a dead-end job, which was frustrating too, that a lady who happened to be a customer of my dad, my father was in business, and this customer of his was a, a lecturer in a college of further ed. And she knew a little bit about me, but not a lot. But she said to me one day, why on earth don't you stop wasting your abilities and get off your backside and do something useful in terms of study? And it was the first time ever in my life that anybody had challenged me about that kind of thing. I had gone through school not liking it, and I didn't want to carry on studying, which was tragic. She actually aroused me from my sleep and some five years later with uh, various qualifications behind me I was heavily involved in a children's mission in Chorleywood in Hertfordshire we were not far from St Andrews at Chorleywood the big Anglican church where John Perry was the vicar who subsequently if you probably know went on to become uh, the the, uh, bishop of Southampton I think and subsequently Chelmsford But we were doing this um, children's mission, and he sparked off the whole thing with a a talk. And uh, his text for the talk was Matthew chapter 18, verse 6. It was a challenge to me that day, and it has remained so down through the years. And this is what it says. If anyone should cause one of these little ones to stumble or the modern version says to lose faith in me it would be better for that person to have a large millstone tied around his neck and be drowned in the deep sea is that Jesus being expressing things in terms of hyperbole I don't think so I think what he was saying was that teachers Education is a serious business. That what we do, what we say to children, is very significant. In James' epistle, chapter 3, if you look at it when you get home, the first verse of James 3 says, in the authorised version, it says, Be not many masters, my brethren. Which you sort of think, well, what does he mean? Look in the New English versions, and it's pretty clear. It says, Don't many of you become teachers? We teachers will be judged with greater strictness than others. To be a teacher, to be involved in education, and I know some of you have been and are, is a a massive privilege. It's also a grave responsibility. David Livingstone, I'm told, said on one occasion, God only had one son and he made him a missionary. I would add to that, he made him a missionary teacher. Because if Jesus was anything, he was a teacher as well. I taught for 27 years. I went through various jobs within school life. I was head of RE in my first job. I was then subsequently head of various years and head of various parts of the school. 
And I finished up my teaching career with a title. I brought the label off my door just to show you for a laugh because that was my title. It said... And I think it says a coordinator of individual pupil guidance. It, that was my title. But I was highly amused because when I was designated as that by the head who gave me that beautiful title, he said, I'll get a label printed to go under your name on your door, says he. And when it arrived, guidance was spelt with an E. This is the revised version. So I had about 1,300 children that I was responsible for. I also, for many years, was a tutor, senior tutor, in the Bromley School Skit Scheme, where we actually interviewed hundreds of graduates who wanted to come into teaching and do a year's on-the-job training. During that time in my career, I taught RE, Music, English, Math, Geography, Personal and Social Ed, Humanities as a General Subject, Motor Vehicle Studies, and on one occasion, for a whole term, I taught Needlework. The first day of my permanent job in school life, I walked into a staff room in a school. I was in Orpington. And two comments from that day have stayed in my mind. I'll share them with you. One came from an English teacher who knew that I'd been appointed as head of RE. She pointed the finger at me and yelled across the staff room. She said, I don't care what you teach the kids about religion, but don't you dare call me a sinner. That was a good opener, wasn't it? That was before we even got to the first lesson. The second, much more helpful comment was made that day by a senior member of the staff who I came to respect immensely. And I heard her talking to a recalcitrant child, and she said to him, the first day I'm ever rude to you will be the day I will accept you being rude to me. And that silenced him. And it found, I found that it worked extremely well during my career. Jesus was a great teacher. He taught by stories, he taught by example, and occasionally he taught by precept. The interesting thing was that people flocked to hear him. I wish I could have gone to my school with that kind of enthusiasm. I couldn't. It's quite an example to follow, isn't it? To follow in the way of Jesus. A few years ago, I was asked by someone why, with four years of theological training, I hadn't gone into the Christian ministry. I had. I wonder how excited you would be if, on a Sunday, five or six new people walked through the door who you'd never seen before who came to listen, to join in with your worship service. Each week, I was privileged to talk to some five or six hundred children, hardly any of whom ever darkened the doors of a church. Most ministers, vicars, preach mainly to the converted. I had an audience of unbelievers for 27 years. And believe you me, that vision of the millstone around your neck, if you failed, was very real. I felt it most keenly when I took assemblies, which I did usually twice and sometimes three times a week. Well, you may be saying to me, well, we've heard a bit about that, but what the heck is education? Is it definable? And I don't really intend to even try. I found I was in a privileged place and able to influence the lives of hundreds of children, and that's what education's about. I didn't ever call my friend, I did become friends with her, I didn't ever call her a sinner. But I did try most years, with the help of outside agencies such as Scripture Union or Operation Mobilisation, to challenge the children in the school, wherever I was, with the Christian gospel. And I want to just share a few kind of anecdotes with you. On one occasion, I was offered the chance to have David and Cary Grant come into the school. Most of you probably know David Grant from doing Songs of Praise and Carrie, his wife, the one with the red hair who does a lot of the judging on the music programmes and they came into my school for a full day and I got them involved in talking to the years 10 and 11 in the personal and social ed classes but at lunchtime I'd arranged for them to do a, a kind of impromptu concert in the hall 
The arrangement was that the children should go and get their lunch and then when they'd had their lunch, if they wanted, they could come and just sit down in the hall and enjoy themselves for half an hour. And I watched in amazement and listened in amazement as those two professional people, both of whom are wonderful, wonderful Christians, spoke to the children, got them singing, got them involved. By the time we got to the end of the lunch hour, the head at the time came to me and he said, I think we are wasting our time if we try to get the kids to go back to school this afternoon. Why don't we just abandon it and leave them here? I'm sure today some heads would be horrified at that. But he left them there. And I remember at three o'clock, as the bell went, there were young people walking down the corridors, singing. Singing a song which David and Carrie had taught them. Jesus is the answer for the world today. I ask you, was that part of education? Or did we miss out on it that afternoon? Our diocesan material, as it's been made clear, um, links in with the sacrifice made by millions in the Great War. And it draws attention to the respect and the gratitude that we should owe those people. And every year, as a school, we ran trips to the World War I battlefields. One year, I remember the head of history had organised her usual trips, and she came to me and she said, I'm not allowing a particular girl, I'm not letting her go. She said she never comes to school very much, and I don't want her to go, because she won't behave herself. And I said, well, I'm going on the trip... If you, send, if you let her go, I'll take responsibility for her. And she relented. And this young lady, who was in year 10, she was a madam, I have to say. But when we got to Sayre Road Cemetery on the Somme, she wandered around the graves. And I could see her reading the inscriptions, and then... She said to me, what's in the gatehouse back here? And I said, well, there's a book in there with all the details about the regiments and so on. I'm going in there, she said. So she toddled in and she started to read. And when it was time to go, to move on from that venue, I shouted to her, come on, I said, it's time to go. And she said, hang on, hang on. And I watched as she went to the nearest front grave in Sarah Road she took the poppy from her lapel which she had obviously been wearing because it was coming up to Remembrance Sunday and she went and gently laid it on the tomb stone of a 17 year old soldier she said nothing she walked into the coach I think she'd learnt a lot On another occasion, we were in Thiepval, Thiepval, whichever you like to pronounce it, the monument on the Somme, which is in recognition of the 70,000, 80,000 men whose bodies were never found. I don't know if any of you have been there, but it's a magnificent monument. We approached it at dusk. It had been arranged that we were going to lay a wreath there, which we usually did every year, and I was going to read a war poem, which is something I often did for the children so they could hear it before we did the two-minute silence as we laid the wreath. I finished what I was reading, and one of the teachers with me nudged me really firmly in the back, and she went, Look, over there. And over there, there were two of the hardest lads that you could possibly imagine. As I finished, they removed their baseball caps without being told, They stood to attention with their hands behind their backs and they bowed their heads and stood there utterly motionless for the two minutes. I looked and I thought that trip was worth it. I'm sure they've learnt a lot. Another lad that day, I remember, got on off the coach at half past 11 at night, looked me in the eye, we'd been to... Lochnagar Crater, we'd been to the Ulster Tower, we'd been to Newfoundland Park, where even today, if you go on a warm day, you can lie on the ground and still smell the mustard gas. 
And as he got off the coach to go back to his home in New Addington, he was a single parent kid, he said to me, Mr Miller, that was the best day of my life. That's gutty. It's about learning. It's about appreciating what happened. And they really got it. These days, we hear a lot about measurable outcomes. We hear a lot about Ofsted. Ofsted passes its judgment, satisfactory, unsatisfactory. They turn up, they peruse carefully prepared policies and schemes of work, and they look at stuff that's been put there specially for them. I guess they have their reward. But for me, education's much more than that. The girl and the lads on the Somme came to see that people had actually died for them. That that was a debt which we cannot easily repay. We cannot do so. And as for the, well, you know, the experience for them. I finish with another little story. I'm watching the time. We were talking about miracles in a year eight class. I liked to do things like that, you know, to get them a bit philosophically challenged. You know, what is a miracle? What do we mean by that? And at the end of the lesson, a a little girl came up to me, and uh, I knew all about her because I was responsible for her pastorally. She'd been in ten different homes of different types during her life. Her mum and dad had rejected her and her brother. And she'd been fostered, and then she'd been in children's homes. At the time, she was in a children's home. And she came to me and she said, I wanted to tell you about a miracle, but I didn't want the others to know. So I said, OK, tell me. She said, well, she said, a couple of weeks ago, Mr. Miller, my manager in the home told me that there was two people coming to see my brother and me. They wanted to take on to adopt some children. She was then 12, and her brother was, I think, 10. She said, well, Mr. Miller, you know me. I'm not very good, and I'm not very clever. And I've got this squint in my eye, which I look funny. And she said, uh, when they came, it was lovely to meet them. But when they went away, she said, I went to bed that night, and I thought... Well, if they want my brother, that would make sense, but I'm sure they won't want me. But she said, the lady in the home came to see me yesterday, and she said, not only do they want my brother, but they want me. And for me, that's a miracle. I just sort of went, oh. I ran down the corridor, I spoke to another member of staff, I said, that's fantastic isn't it? And what was interesting was that I watched that little girl from the second year, as we would have known, at year eight. I watched her grow. The next parents' evening, I watched her sit with her adopted dad, and he held her hand, and he told her things like, I'm so proud of you. You're doing so well. She went on to go to university. Well, you'd believe that, wouldn't you? Because she suddenly realised that there were other things. She realised that there was somebody out there who loved her to bits. And, you know, when I thought about this, I just wanted to finish up by saying this. The people on the Somme realised that somebody died for them. She realised that somebody loved her to bits. And, you know, that's what the Christian gospel is, isn't it? It's about somebody who died for us. And who loves us to bits. And you know, I think when we learn that, our education is complete. But we also need to respond. Just like that little girl had to accept her adoptive parents, we need to say to the Lord Jesus Christ, thank you. I think uh, Mrs Alexander got it right when she wrote that lovely hymn, which is so simple, but... She said, oh dearly, dearly has he loved and we must love him too and trust in his redeeming love and try his works to do. It's given to an ordinary woman to put it that simply and I leave those thoughts with you.